today I'm, we're joining you virtually um, due to everything that's happening with COVID-19, coronavirus. Um, you know, thankfully we have technology and we can continue to, to have some great conversations about the outdoor industry and in particular, really wanted to start having conversations with uh, people who are documenting the history of the outdoor industry, including, I think, the if not the foremost um, historian of the outdoor industry, Bruce Johnson, who's joining me from from your home. Where are you at now, Bruce? Olympia, Washington. Olympia, Washington. Um, so we're going to be doing um, a series of of conversations about the history of gear and kind of diving in and, and talking with you as well as others who are, are trying to preserve the history of the outdoor industry. Um, we'll be doing a series um, from here on out. So thanks for joining me and working through some technical issues and, and making this happen. All right. Thank you, Chase. Um, first of all, just wanted to, to dive in. You've, you've been preserving the history of the industry um, for decades now. Um, and, but, but before we get into, you know, how you started um, documenting and preserving the history of the industry, what's your background? Um, and when did you first become interested in, in the outdoor industry and in gear? My background, really, I, I have to give a whole lot of credit to some factors that originally I had no control over in my youth. I had a father who was a forester. I had a father who was a big time hunter. And so he dragged me out into the woods in Southern Oregon where there are a whole lot of big mountains, tried to make a hunter out of me. And what happened instead was, I didn't like that, but I discovered a great love of the outdoors the mountains especially. So that was really something that I didn't have control over. It just was my environment. And then even earlier than that, when I was a youth, up to about age nine, I lived in upper Michigan where there's, as you probably know, tons of snow and ice, very long snow season up there, very rigorous climate. And my parents, they did not shelter us at all from that. We would go outside in our, our bunny suit things and play in the snow for hours and hours, come in every now and then when we were about to have frostbite, warm up, and go back out. And that led me to, number one, not be afraid of the cold and the snow, and number two, to just have some comfort with the out of doors that I think a lot of uh, raised in the city kids don't have or or kids who are raised in mild climates like Southern California or Florida they just don't have that experience so <clears throat> when you get into uh, your post 18 year old time when you're away from home then I was able to pursue those those uh, interests in going outdoors, being outdoors, climbing mountains, which I did, and very soon discovered it's a pretty rigorous environment up there in the high mountains here in the Northwest, which led to some bad experiences. For instance, <laughs> camping without a tent on a plastic sheet in a Roy Rogers sleeping bag when it was getting 15 or 20 degrees at night because it was early season, uh, taking hot rocks out of the campfire we had and rolling them inside the sleeping bag, spending the night kind of half awake because for half the night the stones were still too hot to get your feet anywhere near. So I had a lot of experiences that uh, led me to think, oh, I need better gear. I need a better sleeping bag. I need a better tent. I need a better pack. So actually going back to when I was still in high school, I bought a frame pack. Very innovative frame pack for the time. 
had an aluminum frame and a little stupid waist belt that didn't really transfer the weight much. Who, who made that? Who knows? Lamport Sporting Goods, Medford, Oregon. They were no REI, that's for sure. So I began my outdoor career that way and pretty early. By the time I got into college, it seemed like I became aware of gear catalogs. And there weren't many back then because that was, well, 66, 67, 68, right in there. So there were a few catalogs floating around, the very early Sierra Designs catalogs, for example, but especially Jerry, Jerry Mountain Sports and uh, Holly Bar. Being poor, my first real piece of gear that I hungered for was a tent, and I got a Holly Bar tent eventually. Somehow I got the money, don't know, that was, deluxe back then to buy anything that was holly bar and began to appreciate high quality gear and that just continued really the rest of my life that I've always appreciated gear that is functional and durable and that's how early gear really was there weren't a lot of frills. They were made to last forever. The uh, companies really stood behind the products. And you could count on the quality and the, the, the smart design because those people in those early companies, they, they did it. They climbed mountains, they backpacked, uh, they lived in the Rockies, for instance, and they, with a rigorous climate. And all that led me to really where I am today. It sounds like you you got interested in gear and, and in the outdoor industry really by, I mean, you, you mentioned that you didn't really have a choice. You kind of got thrown into it. Um, and you started to discover um, really what, that, that products could be better um, by throw, being thrown into that environment and just working with what you had and, and, and realizing, oh, there's a better way. There's got to be better products out there. And um, is that where you started to develop a, a love of gear? Like what, what is it about gear that keeps you coming back and keeps you wanting to learn more? We'll, we'll get into more of you know, how you've been documenting and, and preserving the history of companies and products. Um, but when, when was it that you realized that you had a, this passion and love for, for good products? You know, I'd have to go way back to when I was probably a sophomore in college and I finally dredged together the money for that Holly Bar tent. Mm. Already I had been getting those catalogs and literally memorizing them and appreciating through reading about what good gear was and then finally acquiring a piece of it which just lit the fire for more and <clears throat> i always i uh, in my life was aware there was really good gear and really mediocre gear <laughs> and i'd see the mediocre gear in use sometimes in my friends or people I meet on the trail, but for myself, I always was fascinated with the, the, the whole question of what is good gear, and I would acquire it as much as I could. I've gone through a lot of gear in my life. So what was the state of the industry when you were starting to discover gear? Like, What, what were the brands of that era? Um, it's, it's not like it is today where there's so many brands, so many choices. Um, the outdoor industry wasn't what it is today. It was really the early days of, of kind of those first key players, right? Starting some of those, the, the, the foundational brands that we know today. Um, what, what was the industry like at that time when you were getting in, into all of this? You know, in some ways I would say it was the golden age of uh, mm. um, the gear industry, the early 
roots at golden time. Sure, Jerry and Holly Bar, perhaps Alpsport. Anyway, there were a few that were very much earlier than I, right? That started right after the war. But for myself, it was in the mid to late 60s. And that's when both North Face and Sierra Designs came into being. That's when Mount Safety Research came into being and began kicking ass about a whole lot of uh, deficiencies that they saw. So that's where I became so aware of things in that time frame, which was, I call it the golden age because there was such an awakening and that's when uh, backpacking and the environmental movement and Earth Day really, they all got kicked off right in that frame. So I was very lucky in a way that that's when I came of age. Right. So it seems like it, and we'll talk about this and, and we have an episode planned where we're going to talk to Dr. Rachel Gross, um, uh, an incredible historian of the outdoor industry who she traces a lot of, um, a lot of these early gear companies starting because of, of a lot of people coming back from world war two. Right. Um, and right on you know, acquainted with military gear, um, ac- acquainted with, you know, the good and the bad of, of the gear that they had, the, the 10th mountain division, um, you know, the kind of the winter, winter experts, um, in the military, um, coming back and, and knowing how to ski and bringing some of that back. Um, it, it seems like this combination of things, um, you know, individuals who understand gear coming back and then that era of the sixties and earth day and this, this awareness, um, and care of the environment kind of, seemed like this combination of things really, I, I can see why you'd say that's the golden age, right? Yeah. A lot of ideas yeah. getting thrown around, a lot of new, new ideas, new concepts, probably a lot of creativity and a lot of brands popping up at that time, right? And I, I must say that the fact that we were in a war was a key. It was a really, really big deal, World War II one of the very key developments that led to the explosion in good gear was the invention of nylon. Mm. And that was shortly before world war two. The, um, the women loved nylon because now they had nylon stockings. The war came and the government said no more nylon stockings. This is going to go into our war effort. And they began to use nylon in, many ways not just parachutes but in many many ways so that set the stage for right after the war people who'd suffered through the war in bad gear uh, to say now we have nylon now we're going to make better stuff and we're going to use this here nylon so through this series we're hoping to dive more into some of those topics we we probably can't get too deep into that today Mm -hmm. um but hoping to talk a little bit more about kind of this timeline of events that's led to the industry that we, we know today, including the creation of nylon, the war, uh, everything that's kind of influenced uh, the outdoor industry as we know it today. Um, when did you start documenting um, the history of the outdoor industry and, and why? Why did you feel like you needed to do this? All right, well, go back to uh, college, you have uh, people in your program who are going through college now starting starting out right. I didn't start out right. I didn't hardly know what I wanted to do in college. So I ended up graduating as an English major, which was like worthless. But actually it wasn't in the long haul because mm-hmm. it, uh, it gave me a, a, a love of reading and uh, skills as a writer. <clears throat> so... What led eventually, after a career in the social services field, uh, I had this urge to to uh, write and get stories in like a magazine. So that was Backpacker Magazine. And I tried to get a story in there about Jack Stevenson, the, the nudist revolutionary gear maker. Well, they never bought the story, but my contacts with Jack Stevenson really 
got me started because he was just totally encouraging, sent me just piles of original source material, some of which I still have. And that, that launched me really. So why, so a lot of this kind of grew out of you, you having this desire to, to just write about the industry, right. And, and that English, English major, that English degree that you had, um, who else was doing this at the time? I mean, backpacker was writing stories, but was anyone profiling and, and documenting the history of brands? You know, um, I don't think so. Not, not really early. Um, there's a uh, <clears throat> a fellow who now lives in Bend, Oregon. He used to be the editor of Ski Magazine, who was doing it for uh, uh, an industry publication. He did a whole series on pioneers. He had a lot of good contacts. His his name is Woody. Um, his last name escapes me right this minute, but uh, <clears throat> at some point in the uh, 2000, 2000, I can't say it, but he, uh, <clears throat> he and I got together in person and, and talked and shared and, uh, but as far as others, um, you know, one of my motivations after a while became a sense of alarm that all this history was getting lost because I wasn't seeing anybody else doing it. Right. Yeah. So a lot of that just kind of grew out of you seeing a need and, and recognizing, well, if I don't do it, like who's going to do it? Um, and it, in some ways, that's that's part of how this podcast started too. Is um, you know, I, I've seen yourself and and Dr. Gross and others doing it, um, uh, doing this great work. But I thought maybe there's something that I can do to help preserve and disseminate this information that you've com- compiled and preserved and documented over the years as well, um, and just get stories you know, into a form that people are going to listen to and, and consume. Um, what, when did the formal website come together? Now, you know, a lot of this um, has come together under, on, under your website um, that you've termed the, the history of gear project, right? Yes. Do you mind talking a little bit about that and, and how, you know, when did that formally come together? You had been writing pieces and, and trying to pitch stories to different publications. When did it formally come together and you decided, you know what? I just need to create a history of gear page and, and just start to write my own stories and, and do that preservation work on my own. It actually didn't get going until the late nineties, probably 97 to 98. And the reason was that <clears throat> I had accumulated a bunch of material. Um, I had, some other good sources uh, like Wayne Gregory of uh, Gregory Pax. <clears throat> and I had just accumulated enough stuff that I started to feel like, gee, there's gotta be a way to get this out. That's inexpensive. And I already had a website. So I just started adding on to my, my uh, photography website. And eventually it grew and grew and became what it is now, probably 50 some pages and maybe 30, 40 different companies. So maybe you can briefly share, you don't have to go too in depth because in future episodes, we're going to talk about some of these companies that you started to, to document, but who are some of these brands? You know, some that people may have heard of and some that have come and gone and, and, and some that have, have been gone for years but are being resurrected again and, and, and brought back. Um, what, what are some of the, the companies that, that you've found to be most influential in, in, in really creating the modern uh, outdoor gear industry that we see today? Well, certainly Jerry, certainly Hollybar, certainly Mountain Safety Research. And <clears throat> Frostline Kits is something that most people don't think about as being a pioneer. It wasn't that they created the most innovative gear, but their approach to the whole issue of getting good gear out to people was you make it yourself. And we're going to give you a well-designed kit that you can 
put together and even customize on your own home sewing machine. And I got way into that in the um, 60s, especially probably starting about 66 and customized stuff and made all kinds of stuff. A few pieces I, I still have today. Um, and the importance of that is um, you become not just a user of gear or an appreciator of good gear, but you become somebody who believes that they can design and create their own gear. And that when something breaks or needs repair, hey, they know how to fix it. Well, I, I think that leads into an interesting question of like what what lessons do you think can be learned from from looking back and looking at some of these foundational brands you alluded to one right um like looking back at some of these companies it's kind of empowering to realize oh wow like the early climbing companies these were these were people that were making their own climbing equipment in their garage right and just figured out how to do it or you know these were early people who were just kind of they knew how to sew and they started to make their own gear and then that turned into a company i think looking back at some of those lessons is pretty empowering um, for someone who maybe wants to jump into the industry and you can realize, well, the DNA of this industry is a kind of do it yourself, figure out DIY. Um, and that, that's, mm -hmm. that's available to, to almost anyone. It seems like that's, that's kind of approachable. Um, and that's an interesting lesson. Are there other lessons that you feel like could be learned for, you know, if people were to look back at the history of this industry and you know, what lessons do you take away from some of these early brands? Well, what I take away are things like an appreciation for your customer, mm. being one with your customer, that you do what they do and you want to give them the best that you can create and you stand behind it. Um, Alice Hollybar was a incredible gear designer but she was also somebody that really was super willing to create one-of-a-kind pieces of gear for people and donate it to them especially uh, the mountain safety uh, groups all over the west and that kind of spirit is um, really evident in those in those early companies and less and less so as things got more and more corporate and more and more products got uh, shipped off to uh, being uh, manufactured in Asia over the years. Um, yeah, I have many thoughts about that. And I've been very glad to see the ultralight gear movement has really started to bring back uh, uh, people <laughs> starting companies in their basements and garages. <laughs> well, that's the other thing is at, at the time, were most of these brands manufacturing in the United States? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. The offshoring really didn't start until about 1980 or so. Snow Lion of uh, uh, the Bay Area was really the first to do it in a major way. So what, you know, kind of, kind of a segue, but um how long how long have you been doing this preservation work? You know, I'm going to have to say that it it really began right there about 95 or 96 when I started to get all this material from Jack Stevenson of Warmlight. And uh I guess what's what's the response been um uh, over the years? You know, what are I know that you've, it's led to some interesting things that I'll, you know, I'll ask about here in a minute, but what, uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, I guess, what's the response been? How has the industry embraced this or not? Um, I guess, what's your experience been over the years of doing this work and what keeps you doing it? What keeps me doing it is not only my own internal interest, but the fact that as soon as I started putting stuff out there in the, in the late 90s, um, I had people contacting me a lot consistently. And that included people who had been key in the companies, the early companies. 
could be people like the daughter of uh, Jerry Cunningham. It could be people like Dale Johnson, the guy who started Frostline Kits, who was actually the guy who uh, first urged me to, to write a book about this. And just all kinds of people who were customers, uh, people who uh, worked for the companies. Maybe he was a manager at Holly Bar in Denver in 1973 or something, and they were like excited and they'd offer me material. And uh, this sort of thing has continued, and it's always motivating to me, quite motivating. Have, so it's and and then I I love that you mentioned you know some of these early early founders employees have reached out and shared their stories it, it, when they would reach out was it it mostly to share materials share stories that you could document and is is that was that the primary reason that they reached out to you I think so um, you know when there's been a uh, a time in your life that. Uh, you really look back on in a fond way. But then it seems like it's gotten lost and nobody appreciates or remembers it anymore. And then, oh, here's somebody I can talk to about that. Mm -hmm. there's, yeah, and, there's been a lot of that. Yeah. And, and do you feel like more and more, I, more and more, I feel like the outdoor industry, the current, you know, current day outdoor industry is starting to recognize this need to ground their brand in like an authentic place right and and history is so important um have you seen an increase in in companies that are reaching out to you you know in the last few years as as they're starting to realize oh wow you know we should have done a better job of preserving our early history um and and people reach out to you to to try to piece that together yes uh prime example a few years ago, uh, Sierra Designs, which has been through several corporate hands since uh, the two founders uh, got out of it, they reached out to me from their new headquarters in, in Boulder <clears throat> saying, believe it or not, oh, my, oh, my, you've got some good stuff. We don't have any of our early catalogs. We, we, we know this is a, a, a big problem for us. Do you happen to have them? Well, of course I did, because those early catalogs, they're not just listings of gear. There's stories and philosophical pound, ponderings in them that are, I, they are original artwork and some of the covers and uh, journeys that they took to set up their product shoots to uh, ghost towns in California. Uh, Sierra. Uh, anyway, they're they're priceless. So I sent off a big box full of these catalogs to them. Um, they scanned them and sent me back a disc and um, rewarded me with uh, some great gear. So there's this kind of interchange that's happened more than once with some of these companies. Have you seen that it's great to hear that brands are realizing the importance of that and, and the importance of taking care of their own history. Um, on the flip side, it seems like, and you alluded to this, it seems like the corporatization of the outdoor industry is in some cases is putting some of this history in danger in a way. I don't know if I can say that, but um, you know, I've heard horror stories of, of, uh, you know, historic materials that there was no attachment to that old stuff, right? That was, that was mm -hmm. in a closet at the company. Have you heard stories of that? And, and is there something to that? Oh, yes. Oh, <laughs> um, there are a number of companies that um, got lost or nearly lost. Hollybar was definitely in danger of that as they uh, got absorbed by a big corporation back in the uh, mid 70s. And then that whole company went under 
and eventually North Face had them supposedly own them, but they didn't carry on the brand. And then the founders had both passed away uh, and the whole thing was in danger of getting lost. So when I went to uh, write about this incredible company, one of my biggest challenges at first was I couldn't even find a picture uh, of Alice and Roy Hollybar. I couldn't find any kind of decent picture of them and that took a lot of research to find that and then one thing followed upon another and now i've got you know a uh, 95 page book about the subject full of full of material and photography and so forth but yeah some companies uh, got lost forever yeah and it, it you know i where do you see the state of the industry right now do you see it as overly positive do you see you know, the majority of brands trying to do more to preserve their history, or do you still see a lot of, of issues with brands that aren't, aren't taking care of that history or, or I guess, what do you, what's your sense of the state of things right now? Oh, it's pretty mixed. Um, if you go to the company websites, there sometimes is quite a lot of history material, but sometimes it's really lost on their web pages. You really have to search to find it. Yeah. Other times there's really nothing. Yeah, it Other seems times there's stuff that has errors in it right. that I can recognize. <laughs> yeah. Well, it seems like, like you said, it, it really varies and, and company by company, some take it to the extreme, right? And hire a full-time archivist who preserves and protects that history and the artifacts and the, and the gear. Um, and then in other cases, the com- you know, there's no one in charge of that history. Um, so it, I, I'd agree. I've seen that too. It's, it really varies from company to company. Who do you think is doing it really well right now? Hmm. Well, North Face and Sierra Designs both have a pretty decent effort going, although I haven't been onto their websites really searching it out lately. But I know they've got it. Uh, uh, North Face um, responded very quickly to me a couple years ago when I... um, I had located a sleeping bag that I felt was the first, the first product, the first uh, sleeping bag that they produced in their own factory under their own brand. And I brought it to their attention and I was contacted by indeed somebody who does the history there who uh, snapped it up and, and, uh, rewarded me with some product um there's a um, historian who's been there a long time for eddie bauer that's another one that stands out now whether he's a full-time guy who's paid and has benefits i have no idea but he's really he's got a huge depth of knowledge when i ask him a question about something he's he knows it all it's very very awesome right yeah it it seems like uh, more and more i'm hearing about full-time positions like that that exist Um, in other cases like at rei i know there's a committee that exists within the company and we've we've had conversations with them and that committee is is in charge of of preserving protecting the history of the company um which i think is great it you know having multiple people in charge of that i think you know, provide some structure, you know, some staying power for, for initiatives like that. Um, you've, you've touched on this a couple of times and I should have led with this, but out of all of this, did you ever think that you'd become, a, a you know, really an author of, of how many books, four or five? Um, five about the history of gear itself. I have some others that are not, specifically history of gear. Mm-hmm. Did you ever think that would, would happen? Nope. <laughs> no, really it was, um, uh, 
Dale Johnson at, at uh, Frostline Kits, uh, who said, you, you really should write a book about this, and then uh, sent me uh, uh, some of a book he was creating himself about Frostline, which I don't even know if it ever got published, but um, he has since passed away. So, no, but I, it just came to pass after a while, just like the website that, wow, I have all this material and now I have somebody who should know, tell me, encourage me, just like Jack Stevenson did as far as actually uh, writing. And uh, so if you don't have any mentors, you might say, uh, the going is, is rough. Yeah. What, what are the topics of those books? They are specific to what I felt were the, the chief gear innovators in the early days. Right. Jerry, Hollybar, Frostline, Mountain Safety Research, and uh, Stevenson's Warm Light. Uh, there's plenty of others that I, I have material on, but I've just not had the time, energy, or money to put them into a book form. Right. So that's my next question. Are you actively working to preserve history right now? Like, oh, are sure. there projects that you're working on? What and and what does that look like for you day to day as you're seeking out the history of the industry and preserving it? What does that look like? Is it writing? Is it a lot of contacting people? Uh, is it tracking down those pieces of gear? What are you actively working on right now? You know, um, the work goes in, in phases. Uh, I'll get contact uh, from somebody or I'll, I'll uh, find out about, oh, the founders of Banana Equipment are still around and now here's a way to contact them. And next thing you know, I've got a little project going on them. I've got a folder. I've got pictures of the founders. I've got their description of how they got started. And, and I archive it. Now, the archive might end up showing up in the website. Potentially, it winds up down the road being in a book. Uh, but there's this big piece called archiving. You get the stuff, you get the email, you get whatever it is, uh, this piece of historic gear. And I'm out with my camera doing a big photo shoot and creating a, a, an archive of that early Jerry pack, you know, the, uh, what zippers it was using, the detailing, and archiving, 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 because it's so easy to just have material go flowing by you day to day, but it takes a lot of effort to actually decide, wow, look at this. This person who used to work at Early Winters sent me this incredible long email full of history. Now, what do I do with it? Well, I copy paste it into Word, properly label it. I might even print it out and put it into my hard copy archives. So there's all that going on all the time, but the workflow isn't um, steady because I have a lot of other things going on in my life. This is, this is just a big overgrown hobby, Chase. Yeah, yeah, sure. So why, why do you keep doing it? I mean, you, you could have given up on this long ago. Uh, what drives you to keep, keep participating and in, in doing this work? You know, especially where other people are getting into it, right? You're seeing, um, and this isn't to, to, you know, push you away and say, stop doing it. But, you know, I've started to see more people doing it. You know, Dr. Gross um, at, at Utah State, there's a, a growing archival effort um, focused on the outdoor industry, which you and I have talked a lot about. Why do you keep doing that in that case? Well, I don't see that these other people are detracting from me. Right. I've been, I've been talking to Rachel for years. Yeah. Um, and uh, Alan Tabor in the Bay Area, who's so good on all that Bay Area stuff and the oral histories, uh, he's a wonderful guy. And I, I, I attended one of the outdoor research conferences with him. Um, no, I... I feel 
companionship <laughs> with these other people uh, doing it. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to last forever. I want to make sure that my stuff gets out there right. and gets into a more um, permanent place. Right. Yeah, it's, it's definitely, I think that's definitely the challenge, right? It's like all the archiving can happen, but if it's not accessible, right, then, then there's no one to appreciate it. So I, I know that's one of the focuses that, that the university has taken um, with the creation of this outdoor recreation archive that we're an active part of um, is, is, you know, having a place where these hard copies can live, but then they can be digitized and then accessed by any, anyone across the world. Right. Um, it's disseminating that information once it's been collected and archived, like, you know, kind of following the pattern that you've created over the years. Exactly. Um, another example is again, Frostline kits. Um, it was such a hugely successful company. Uh, it got going in 1966 and they doubled their growth every single year for almost 10 years afterwards until uh, the kit industry started to fall apart for various reasons I could get into later. But um, And so <clears throat> that frost line uh, examples, so there's so many ways it's relevant. Um, ask me another question about that. I've lost my track. Well, we, we can, uh, I, I was going to mention um, how, how the industry is, is being influenced by your work in, in history um, and preserving the history. We're seeing brand revivals happen. Um, and ah, you've been a part of that. Um, I'd yes. be curious if you could speak a little bit to, to that. It seems like I know that my generation, you know, we're always interested in something that's vintage or retro or, um, we love a throwback. Um, I think more and more people appreciate that, right? That heritage look that, you know, something that feels like it's, it's been around for a long time. Um, do you see that, you know, being influenced by, I guess you, there's some of these brand revivals that you've been a part of. I, I'm sure that plays into it. This interest in, in history and in, in that vintage look and in the classic designs, um, has that played into, into, you know, some of these initiatives that you've been a part of to revive brands? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, in a cultural sense, um, I think the allure of the heritage is some sense of um, stability in changing and scary times. Um, looking back on history and finding some kind of stability there, mm -hmm. um, some solidity that's lacking now in the way that products just come and go and zoom through in, in the space of less than a year and then they're gone. And um, so heritage, yeah, it's, I've had, quite a few contacts uh, related to uh, people wanting to uh, repair a heritage product, but also people who want to restart a heritage company. I had a Dutch guy who wanted to uh, <laughs> restart uh, class five, the company with that beautiful rose. Um, and I think it's wonderful. Yeah. Are, are, do you have some more examples of that? I know Holy Bar is one I, more recently that's, mm -hmm. that's revived. Um, I know it's a, is it an yeah. Italian, Italian company that, that owns that brand now and is, you know, we've had some conversations with them as well, but it, what, what has that been like that experience with you working, um, working with some of these companies to revive a brand? What does that look like as you're kind of acting as a consultant? Mm -hmm. Well, Holly Bar, um, uh contacted me, uh, his name is Alberto, um, mm -hmm. seeking a brand that was number one worthwhile in terms of being a brand that had real panache and also that it was available or how could you find out if it was available because he's in Italy, he doesn't know these things. So uh, there was a big 
research on my part uh, that finally settled in on Holly Bar and uh, uh, led to him working it out with North Face to take over that that uh, trademark. That's that's and, another interesting thing is is how many of these old trademarks are just floating around from old brands that have come and gone. Um, who owns them? Who knows? There's there's probably quite a few of these brands that were wildly popular and and through a series of events have fallen by the wayside and those trademarks are floating around, red, you know, waiting to be picked back up at some point. Uh, for it seemed like uh, years, I would get emails from people who wanted to buy a Holly Bar kit or uh, there, there were so many kit companies at one point, but especially Frostline kits. They wanted to buy a Frostline kit. They thought I was Frostline mm -hmm. and they wanted to buy a kit from me. Um, finally, I wrote an article for a, a big sewing group that exists in the United States saying, yeah, it's really gone and there's not really been a replacement. Um, and <clears throat> I, I don't know. The, the, the point with Frostline is, is that uh, I bring it up because it's such an example of something that uh, went strong for a while and then got, and then got lost. But the trademark on that, I found out, at least as of a couple of years ago, was available. You could buy it from the Colorado Department of uh, whatever it is, state, uh, for like $25. <laughs> You had to be a Colorado resident was the only hang up where I, I might have done it just for the heck of it. Wow. That's, it's really interesting. And, and I can hear like the passion in your voice for like these brands and these products and, and this history. Um, it kind of leads me to, I, I sent you this. Well, the, I mean, this quote is, is on your website, but it, it kind of brings me back to like, why products? Like, why are we having this whole podcast, this whole episode? Like, why are we talking about things, right? And what is it about these things that that can like elicit these feelings, you know, for a brand, for for a product? And and I think um, this quote from Peter Whitaker, um, part of that that first American team, right, to climb Everest. Um, mm -hmm. Equipment is your life. You have to be prepared to deal in extreme temperatures and extreme weather. Simplicity is important be it packs or outerwear, you know, that first line equipment is your life, especially in the outdoor industry, right? It's like you depend on it for so much. And maybe that's where that, that attachment comes from. And, and even if it's not a life-saving piece of gear that, you know, I've become attached to a jacket or a backpack or something, maybe that it, it goes back to that, you know, do you have thoughts on that and where sure. this attachment comes from? Uh, you know, um, I think gear is very um, symbolic. Uh, it's a connection to, in my case, the mountains and adventures that I've had um, when I preserve or repair a piece of old gear. It's kind of like I'm repairing or uh, fixing up uh, a past experience and reliving in, the, in, in a way. Um, and that's what's so great about a lot of the older products. They're so durable. They're not just going to fall apart and then you feel like, oh, what a piece of, pardon my French, um, that goes in the garbage can. Yeah, right. Like, like some of these super cheap tents you can buy that just fall apart. Yeah, you can have multiple memories with, with the older products, right? These heritage items that, that will last longer or, or were built to be repaired and reused. Um, yeah, I'm with you. It's the scars are what make some of those products like even more memorable, right? Like the rips that you repair and those are battle scars. Those are, um, those are memories, right? Um, mm -hmm. of adventures you'd had, had in the past. Um, and that's why we're doing this whole, you know, having this whole conversation, right. Is, is because of these, these thoughts and feelings, but, um, I, you know, we could talk about so much more and we will. Um, but I, I think we should wrap this one here. Um, Thanks for taking the time. Thanks for doing the work that you've been doing for so long. Um, you know, people like me really appreciate it and, and really appreciate digging into the history and, and learning about these brands I'd never heard of before. Um, so looking forward to more conversations. We're, we're going to hopefully have a few more of these. 
um, and talk a little more in depth about certain brands that have had an impact um, on the industry and, and on people. So thanks again for your work. Well, thank you for bringing this whole project, which I call the History of Gear Project, bringing it into more public exposure at this stage of things um, and being open to helping me out in my efforts to get the word out more and preserve what I, I have created over the years. Of course, of course. Well, we'll, we'll keep having more conversations um, and getting out there. Um, again, thanks for all you do. And thank you, Chase.